Well, hello, welcome. <laughs> we are going to be talking about managing issues in crisis communications today. Um, just so you know, this accounts for 13% of the exam. And um, this is the part where I feel like is, is more heavily um, focused on applying um, rather than memorizing, which you're probably finding for a lot of the areas of, of the APR exam. But um, there's, not, there's not a lot of definitions or you know, history, that kind of stuff that you need to be memorizing. It's more about applying. So um, just, a, just a helpful tip, you know, reviewing as many scenarios as you can, um, finding those examples in your daily work um, are, are always great to kind of stop and analyze. Um, and then just, you know, um, reading as much as you can. Um, even current news events are <laughs> a great way um, to, to apply um, this process of looking at issues and how to manage them, risk management, crisis communications. So it's all around us if you, if you stop and look around. But anyway, let's get started. So um, this first slide here just talks a little bit about some references and study material. Um, obviously your APR study guide is, is your number one, but these two books, um, Strategies and Tactics was always my favorite. Um, this book really provides some solid examples, um, one after another, um, of, throughout, throughout, for all the chapters really, but especially for, um, for this topic. Um, so if you've got the ninth edition, just chapter 10, and then also effective public relations, um, whether you have the ninth edition, which I know is probably a little old, there may be a 10th or 11th out there now, um, but it was the, the, one of the first chapters, it just has one page on it. So, but um, there's a lot of good material in these, um, in these uh, books. So, and don't feel like you have to write this down. I'll be sending this whole presentation to um, um, Jenna so she can send out to everyone too. And I obviously Chris is recording it, so. You're a lifesaver. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about taking a lot of notes. But anyway, um, so I thought I'd start with this quote. I really liked it. Um, it says, an organization, even with good intentions, makes policies and decisions that often bring it into conflict with some segment of the population and opposing groups. This is why public relations professionals must be well-versed in strategic conflict management and how to deal with multiple publics that are affected in different ways. I thought that kind of teed up our topic today nicely. And as we go through um, the, the session tonight, um, what I plan to do is talk about kind of three, I broke it up into three sections. Um, issues management, risk management, and crisis communication, and then we're just going to get into some fun exercises and some scenarios because, as we all know, that's what the exam is all about scenarios and how you would answer those. Um, so, um, we'll go into the first part here. And I'm sorry, I just have to move my screen of you people a little bit so I can see my words. Okay, so um, issues and risk management. Um, I, this is a lot of this stuff is in your APR study guide, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time re, you know, uh, restating what's already in there. But just so we all have um, kind of an understanding of what the, the the topics are. So issues and risk management identifies potential or emerging issues that may impact the organization as well as risks to the organization or client. Analyzing probability and potential impact of risk ensures an organization develops appropriate response plans, designs and deploys a strategic public relations response. So this is, this is all the stuff that happens pre-crisis, right? Um, it's, it's, trying, it's taking that proactive stance, not reactive, which is more the crisis management side. So crisis management understands the roles and responsibilities of public relations at the pre-crisis crisis and post-crisis phases, communicates the implications of each at these phases and understands the messaging needs of each, looks beyond the current organizational mindset. And then you have counsel to management, which I feel like kind of applies to both, right? It understands the importance of providing counsel to the management team or client regarding issues, risks, and crises, and looks beyond the current organizational mindset considers and accommodates all views of an issue or crisis, factors, views into communication strategy. So issues in risk management and crisis communication planning are two areas in which research, which is the first um, step in the four step process can really play an important role. So let's look a little deeper into um, these. 
So um, issues, management, and risk communication and management. So um, one of the big things here um, is environmental scanning. And I like to kind of think of this as, as like your SWOT um, analysis. You're, you're predicting problems, you're anticipating threats, you're looking for opportunities, minimizing risk, resolving problems and preventing crises ultimately. Um, so again, really proactive, not, not so much reactive, but what are we gonna do to kind of prevent um, any issues? What's brewing? Um, identifying solutions to counter reputational damage. So here I thought we could just take a, a quick, quick break here and what are some examples? And let's kind of discuss those examples of um, things that might be, you know, things that can be avoided, right? Issues that can come up in an organization or business um, where you can do some proactive planning, identifying solutions on how to counter it. These aren't, um, you know, immediate emergency type of situations, but what are some issues um, that you can think of? Uh, Nina, hey, this is Paul. So yeah. I am, we're kind of dealing with an issue right now. Um, so, you know, I work in agriculture. And so there was a documentary um, about regenerative agriculture. And so it kind of takes a swing at just conventional farming practices. Mm -hmm. And um, so through that, you know, we had already kind of established that regenerative was an up and coming issue. Um, so we had put together kind of an issue brief on you know, sustainable practices that soybean farmers are participating in and investments that our organization is making that can be related to regenerative. So mm -hmm. the fact that it was somewhat of a buzzword and we knew that there were some documentaries and articles coming up on this, we tried to kind of nip it in the bud beforehand. Perfect. Perfect. That's a great example. I'll provide one from my organization. I work at Logan University and obviously with a lot of, you know, universities and colleges going online because of COVID, we have a lot of students who are questioning the value of an online, you know, education and, you know, should tuition be reduced and, you know, are they getting what an in-person, you know, education would provide? So that's, that's something. Um, obviously, we're, we're looking at, we're considering we're, we're um, trying to identify ways to combat that a little bit with um, literature and, and statistics and data and all sorts of stuff. So Kelly or Bridget, can you think of any examples either from your own organizations or that you may have read about in the news? I work at a university as well. And so <laughs> it's a very similar and it's pretty much ongoing right now just because it's just something new um, every day. But um, yeah, I, I think right now we're in a situation where we have a decent team assembled and what we're looking at right now is making sure we're cross training each other. So if someone is sick or is on vacation or out, we make sure that the COVID cases get posted to the website, that we have someone around to respond to media relations. Um, we're continuing to keep the normal um, faculty and staff communications processes going um, and uh, also utilizing um, our communications um, work study students um, mm -hmm. and having them learn about the field and the process um, and giving them some tasks as well has been helpful. Perfect. Okay. Other example, Kelly, do you have some examples? I was just going to say the kind of the non COVID thing that came to mind um, was, you know, the summer with all of the race and Black Lives Matter and a lot of um, emphasis put on should there be SROs in school, should there not be, and kind of having a plan in place for when those discussions came up and, and kind of knowing how we would handle those discussions and what we right. wanted to do. So that, that was kind of the first thing that came to my mind. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So okay, other examples? Oh, oh, sorry. An example as well. Um, Last year, we, we just ended actually a 12 month or 10 month contract with a, a, a company that uh, uses a chemical called ethylene oxide to sterilize medical equipment. And they were facing, I guess, community outrage and other or lawyers that were coming in to try and do a class action lawsuit because of other territories using this as a carcinogen. 
that creates cancer. And the EPA, we were able to kind of do a community action campaign to uh, educate people in the community um, to basically uh, make the organization a favorable organization in the community because it's one of the biggest employers in this rural area. So we turn it into a positive by uh, explaining the, well, obviously because of COVID, it actually turned into a positive because they, um, they sterilized medical equipment for hospitals and uh, other organizations. Sure, that's a great one. Good, so it sounds like you guys have a good handle on that. The other ones I had written down are um, human rights violations, ethical dilemmas, mismanagement, environmental issues like you guys both brought up, um, and racism in the workplace, as Kelly mentioned. So yeah, that's essentially, it's looking for those issues and um, trying to get to the solution um, early before it becomes a crisis. So risk communication involves communicating information that positions the organization favorably, that protects public from harm. And here we can again discuss what are some examples of that. Um, what would be some risk communication? So now we're looking at, okay, we've identified what the issue is. How do you communicate that risk, right? Um, I'll, I'll start with an example to kind of get the, the juices flowing, but um, warning labels on products, product recalls, that kind of thing. Um, those are, okay, we've identified what a problem is. How are we gonna communicate this now before it becomes a crisis? That's the risk communication. Can you guys think of any other examples? So I, I'm, I'm thinking that the one that I'm going to share um, does, um, but it might be more indirect, but I'm also the, the person that um, manages our emergency alert system. Mm -hmm. And so um, if there's, anything, even if it's, um, you know, the smell of gas or if it would be an active shooter or something like that. We have, I'm the one that receives those messages from the police and then issues the, the um, alert. We have templates created into the um, alert system that are designed to get the messages out quickly when everybody's really tense, mm -hmm. so that we're communicating with our internal audience, and so that's my role in, say, in a, in a, you know, event or a crisis management situation. And then we have other team members that will then be assigned to media, that will then be assigned to updating the website um, and different aspects of commuting communicating to not only the students, faculty, and staff, but also then to the media and, and the general community. But we're finding, I'm finding that the alert system, um, even though it's a technology, you know, wording of, of the messages, um, where people should go to, to make adjustments or changes to their settings or devices. Um, right. And, you know, how to get that information out to parents as well as to the students. So. Right. So you're trying to alert the community before it becomes, so before crisis happens and people are like, I don't know how to get information or where I'm supposed to go for it. You're, you're trying to take that, get a step ahead of that and say, here's a system, here's how to use it. Here's all the information about it. So when this happens, you're prepared. Right, and then we have a protocol for how often we will update, push mm -hmm. out updates to that system, and, and each scenario is different, um, um, but we know that we need to push out regular communications right. through that channel on, and updates. Even if we don't have anything to update, we, we still need to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Great, what else? I guess, Nina, one that comes to mind for me is, so one of the end uses of soybeans is for biodiesel. And so we have an organization called National Biodiesel Board, and they put out a lot of educational materials and webinars about the proper use of biofuels. Um, and so that's really important as farmers are using this in their, you know, their large, large scale machinery. So I think that is, if those educational materials and if that organization didn't exist, you know, we could run into issues of, you know, proper use of, of biodiesel. So that's just 
Yeah. I don't know if that. That's a great one. Okay. Yeah. Because I feel like that that's taking a very proactive um, uh, method of communication to alert something so something bad doesn't happen, right? You're, yeah. you're informing, you're educating. So that was a good one. Yeah. And I wonder if like stakeholder mapping and stakeholder engagement is a part of that mm -hmm. and kind of working to make, to make sure um, that you have, you know, people on the ground to mobilize um, in case a crisis or something were to happen. Yeah. I, I read about a great case study. It may have actually been in strategies and tactics about uh, um, an organization. I'm not going to remember what it was, but um, think of it probably like a, it was like a factory or something, something where explosion could happen or something could something detrimental could happen in the community maybe there were other things and so they way ahead of you know just nothing had happened yet but they decided they were going to yeah like you said engage people in the community talk about how they're safe how they practice safe you know the, the, how their standard for safety was really high and they could start as kind of like this community campaign right so mm -hmm. If something ever did happen, they felt like the community knew them and they, they, they you know, were going to take responsibility and they weren't just this, you know, company that didn't care. And so anyway, that, that would be mm -hmm. another example. And Nina, that's the same thing that we did for the ethylene oxide company, the sterilization company, is we created mm -hmm. a community outreach campaign. We ended up getting all of the local politicians, the, the city mayor, the council members, the everyone involved in understanding what the company is, what they did or what they do um, right. before the EPA was to hold a hearing. And we were able to do such a great job at um, community outreach and information that the EPA mm -hmm. decided to eliminate their hearing on this company because the, 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 the community was already informed as to what the company does and how they operate. Right. Yeah, that could have gone completely the opposite way had they not taken that proactive stance, right? That could exactly. be, be, become a big crisis. Good. Kelly, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so the, the one that I thought of, um, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I work for a school district, and um, we all know that virtual learning didn't go super great for anybody in the spring. So um, as we were thinking about coming back to school in the fall and what that would look like, um, you know, we did start the school year completely virtual and we knew that our families would be concerned about the type of learning that their kids would get. And so we, um, we actually started a week later to give our families or our teachers more time to learn virtual teaching techniques mm -hmm. um, that I know a lot of other school districts didn't do. So it was kind of like not only communicating that through, you know, social media posts and newsletters, but also um, we offered a virtual training that the parents could also participate in so they could kind of see the information that our teachers were getting and um, things that the parents could also do so that they could right. be a little bit more at ease before the school year started. Right, right, That's that has been a huge one everywhere. So yes, very good timely example there. Yes. All right, okay, so moving on um, to, oh, Sorry. Okay. To um, crisis communication. So here um, we're going to talk about three different kinds of crises. Um, there's immediate, emerging, and sustained. So immediate is a sudden incident that requires an immediate reaction, and allows little time for research or planning. Crisis plans. Uh, crisis plans outline general responses, and those plans allow management to react quickly and without confusion. What are some examples of immediate crises. I'm sure we all can think of at least one or two. <laughs> just shout it out. <laughs> I mean, I would say, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say like, if there's a death or an illness or something um, of that nature. Right. Yeah. What else? In my field, incidents like school shootings, earthquakes, tornadoes, things that happen. Yep. During the Natural day. disasters, Natural right? Disasters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Violence, crime. Mm -hmm. They're all pretty negative. <laughs> um, the county yeah, executive okay. signing an order that you can't have events? Well, I'm sorry? The county executive signing an order that you can't have right. events like a graduation right. ceremony? Right, mm-hmm. That might be emerging. I don't know if that would be immediate or if it would be emerging. Um, if you knew it was coming and, but it could be considered an immediate, especially if your event was 
going to happen the next weekend, you have to switch gears quickly. I'm just right? taking, for instance, the Logan University. Yeah, no. no. Last, oh, uh, I know. Yeah, we had two weeks, summer. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Those are all good examples. Yes, immediate. It's just sudden. You didn't know it was coming. Um, you have little time to plan. Emerging or shouldering? That's an issue that's been that's brewing. Um, there, it says because emerging crises are not possible but probable, organizations have time to research and to plan how to eliminate the problem or how to respond if a crisis erupts. What are some examples? This gets a little harder. What's an example of an emerging crisis? I'm actually. <laughs> This is probably good right now. Um, I'm watching the parent comments on the Facebook Live and stuff. And, and so this is one thing that I'm kind of, a couple of us are watching and, and parents are feeling really uneasy about the hybrid learning and um, having their kids on campus. And then what if I have to bring them back right away? And we're not planning to, um, stop on campus learning after Thanksgiving. Students are going to come back, but many schools are, and we're, we're feeling some of our parents discussing that. And so we're just kind of feeling it out and, and you know, watching this discussion. And um, we have people from, you know, various parts of the university that can jump in and, and add um, not only residential life information, but safety and security and then academics um, to talk about those issues. But it could, it could really yeah. change overnight, if not That's right. quicker. That's right. So yeah, you know, this is coming. Things are, could change. Um, and you already know what the concerns are. So that's a great example of emerging. What else? Um, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Kelly. Okay, I was just gonna say um, for us, um, kind of staff response and return to coming back to full time or mm -hmm. hybrid learning. You know, a lot of places you're hearing of um, teachers' unions specifically protesting, having sick outs where they don't come into work, um, and kind of knowing that mm -hmm. that could potentially happen, that we might just have a day where nobody shows up to work and what we do right. if it happens. And, Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can start planning for that now. Like mm -hmm. what happens if no one shows up? What's your plan? So, exactly. yeah. right. Okay. Chris, Paul? I would, I would say for us, um, for COVID, it was immediate in some aspects, but it was also emerging as well because, you know, the, the farming industry really didn't see the impact of COVID on the um, demand of, you know, soybean oil for like, um, you think cooking oil in restaurants. Mm -hmm. So really see that until um, COVID happened and all the restaurants started closing. So it was like a month or two months after. So we were trying to figure out, you know, how is this gonna impact supply? And so that was, gave us a little bit of time to, research it and and see what the what the impact would be great chris um I, I guess from my experience there could be a couple different examples but one of which is when i was uh actually setting up the 9 11 museum to travel around the country and uh the client was upset at one point that uh in tampa where we had it we didn't have security and was worried that the 9-11 museum might get tagged or graffitied or uh, vandalized in some way. And I, I guess, I, I mean, this is a roundabout way, but we, we kind of created a plan to where if that was to happen, um, we would end up getting national publicity on it and kind of, I don't want to say spinning it, but using it as a way to raise hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars uh, from that happening. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, it's something that could happen. It's, it's taking something that could happen and figuring out how to, you know, solve the problem. Um, so we, we didn't have security. So, I mean, if anything did happen, we kind of had a, a backup plan as to how we would rebound and use it maybe to our benefit if something were to happen to the 9 -11. Right. Okay, good. Um, some other examples I have, um, a safety violation that might be um, happening within a company, uh, bankruptcy, 
Uh, maybe the co you know the company knows it's coming down the line. How are they going to handle that? A cyber attack. This has been a big one in recent years where you know um, the company finds out first, and then it's okay. Um, how are we now going to? I mean, that could be immediate, but some of these, some of them are are more emerging. Um, maybe they realize there's weaknesses in the system. It could happen. Um, harassment and, and protests and strikes, like Kelly mentioned, definitely um, that happening. So, okay, good. Uh, it seems like everyone kind of gets a good understanding of that one. Um, and sustained, the sustained crisis, these are continued negative news coverage or rumors about an organization. These often evolve from immediate crises. Sorry, I'm seeing errors in my PowerPoint. Sustained crises can cause lasting reputational damage. What are some examples? of the sustained uh, crisis. And you can't use COVID. <laughs> Try to think outside of that. It's a little harder, but there are definitely some. Um, and, and think about to the ones that you just thought about for emerging. I'll start. The one that they cite in the book is the BP oil spill. That's obviously a big one that was dealt with for years and years and years. Um, another could be a lawsuit um, that goes on for a long time and has a detrimental effect on an organization or business. We have one, a couple that um, comes up every few months or so and and that was um, that, well, it, it relates to um, a college campus being more liberal versus conservative views. And we had a very conservative speaker on campus and we had, we knew students were going to protest and we encouraged peaceful protest, but it did get out of hand and um, uh, some students, in fact, I, we're not sure that they were even students, they may have just been people in the community actually got close to the speaker and had sprayed bleach, what they, the speaker thought was bleach water on the speaker. And so that comes up every now and then, it'll come up with the legislature as well as being a public university. And mm -hmm. so as, as soon as we think it's, you know, it'll never go away but as soon as but then it comes up again or the speaker himself will get on twitter and start talking about it and then it'll be back in the news again mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so we just have to stay on our toes and and know what the um communications points are um, sure. yeah i think for us nina where we see sustained um issues is in perceptions of Agriculture, so for example, um, you know, soybeans, they use biotechnology or GMOs as people call them. And so that's a hot mm -hmm. and there's a lot of consumer confusion around, you know, why farmers use genetically modified crops. Um, yeah. This has been ongoing since like. Yeah, like the 70s, right? <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's just something where it's just continued education and outreach about the safety um, of genetically modified crops and um, the environmental benefits actually um, that that's helping farmers be more sustainable. So I think that is kind of like a, the perception of certain technologies and it's, it's a constant um, educational opportunity. That, yes, exactly. That was a great one. Any others? I also have merger and acquisition um, down as a sustained crisis. Um, uh, these often can can take a long time, and even after they've happened, they're still, you know, um, uh, I guess the effects of it, right? And so, um, just another example of that. So, well, and that reminds me too, Nina, that that would be a sustained issue um, where it's actually the staff and. Um, those are the the primary stakeholders that you have in mind that it's more of an internal mm -hmm. um, item that you have to navigate as opposed to external. I usually when right. I think issues, I think external. Mm -hmm. But I feel like mergers and acquisitions, you have your staff that is probably constantly asking questions and and wondering what the status is. Right, right. 
I mean, that, that is, yeah, it, it gets into a lot of crises if it's not, um, you know, thought about and, um, you know, ahead of time or even before it happens with new leadership coming in or, you know, people, rumor mills that people are going to get laid off and uh, there's just all sorts of stuff that goes with that. So, yeah. Do you see, I've, I've gotten some questions from some leadership um, as I bring up issues management, we're trying to prioritize different issues mm -hmm. and assess which ones we need to build out resources for. But I've been getting a lot of questions about um, positive um, opportunities. So most of the issues that I'm listing are, you know, have negative implications, right. um, but, but the staff wants me to identify, you know, positive opportunities and issues where we could actually um, turn that into, you know, uh, a, a different way to build demand or th that type of thing. So yeah. for the APR, is it primarily negative issues that you're assessing or is there opportunities as well? That's a great point. Um, everything I've read <laughs> seems to focus on, uh, on, on the negative. Um, and it's, it's interesting that it does because, um, I mean, think of like your example that you brought up or just um, a company growing too fast, right? Like what a great problem to have, but it can become an issue and it can become a crisis, right? Um, if it's not managed well, or it's not, um, you know, leadership is not taking the proper steps to assess that risk. Um, but there are things that are positive, um, especially with issues management, right? So. I think that's a great way to look at it. And I'm sure you could find some good examples. Um, but again, it's interesting in what I've read, um, and I did read through all my textbooks again before this, um, a lot did focus on the negative. Mm -hmm. As you think of, you know, crisis as negative, um, you know, even the word risk, you know, is that has a very negative connotation to it, so. Gotcha. But some, definitely something to think about and kind of expand and broaden your, your thinking around um, um, issues management. Okay, so moving on. Um, so talking a little bit more about crisis management, these are kind of the elements of crisis management according to your study guide that will probably come up at some point. Um, the things you need to have in place, obviously a crisis team, you know, and, and the I didn't bullet every single thing under um, your study guide on this, but, you know, assigning specific roles, training a spokesperson, making sure there's lists and, you know, backup people and all that. So having that team in place, um, having an up-to-date crisis plan. So building one and then making sure it's um, up-to-date, it's reviewed on a regular basis. It kind of talks about all those things we discussed, like the SWAT, assessing vulnerabilities and risks, you know, um, weaknesses in the company or organization. And then, yeah, obviously reviewing the plan regularly. So um, those are kind of the three elements of, of that crisis management. And then the four paramount issues in, um, oh, gosh, in crisis planning, um, defining the risk for each potentially affected public describing the actions that will mitigate each risk defined and identifying the cause of the risk and demonstrating responsible management action. Um, so this is more of like a process um, um, within crisis planning um, as you encounter these situations. So moving on to that, I liked this. I thought we, I just like finding when these quotes, they just really resonate. Um, this is from um, Jim Lukaszewski. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him or if you've seen his name or heard him. He's kind of like known in the PR world. Um, I think he's based in Minnesota, um, but he does a lot on crisis communication. And if you search his name on the internet or if you go to this link below, I highly recommend you reading this um, article. This is just one snippet I have from it, but the whole article is fantastic. And he breaks down a case study a real situation that actually happened. Um, he breaks the whole thing down and it kind of just uh, puts everything, provides a framework for everything we're talking about today. So read anything you can um, from him because he's just, he's brilliant in, in the area of crisis communication. So um, I wanted to have you guys kind of think about this quote. The most challenging part of crisis communication management is reacting with the right response quickly. This is because behavior always precedes communication. I like that. 
Non-behavior or inappropriate behavior leads to spin, not communication. In emergencies, it's the non-action and the resulting spin that cause embarrassment, humiliation, prolonged visibility, and unnecessary litigation. Helping management understand the impact of inappropriate or poorly thought out crisis response is one of the most important strategic services the public relations practitioner can provide. Just that that really just summed up kind of the crisis communication um, whole, um, you know, process pretty well. So again, a good resource for you guys as you continue on your journey here. So. I've got a couple of um, practice exercises. These are scenarios. These are very similar to what you'll probably see on the exam. Um, these are taken from um, the APR study guide coaches manual. So they were provided to me. I did not make them up. I didn't love them. They're a little out there and you're kind of like, okay, this isn't super believable. But, um, <laughs> but what I added was a question down below that I felt like maybe that's a better question to answer. So we'll, we'll talk through these as a group. The scenario one, number one is, you work for a large medical lab. Your office is on the other side of town from the main lab. At midday, a tornado hits your office and destroys everything. You have no cell service, no Wi-Fi, landline, internet connection. You can't access your computer or internet to, uh, due to, uh, or to review the crisis plan. The list of phone numbers you keep in your desk has also been destroyed. Power lines are down, police are keeping streets clear. How will you communicate your situation to your main lab and local news organizations? That's the question they provided. I was like, really? <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll talk through that one. And then what I think a more appropriate question would be is what would you have done differently? But anyway, let's back up. How, how what, what, what do you guys do? Who wants to take a stab? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, because we actually talked about a, a similar scenario because we have um, the uh, health sciences campus at a different location from our main campus. And we've we've talked about all of these things, no cell service. So we've already identified a business nearby um, and we've got a couple, one being Whole Foods right across the street. And so we've already talked to the manager there that in the event of a total shutdown, we, we want, a, few of our team members to come over there and then we've already talked through we may not have computers we may not have phones can we what can we use there of yours and set up a mini um communications um stand right. um if it happens on our other campus they've identified businesses and, and areas there they're near the hospital so we know they're always going to have backup power there so so that's helpful but we may need to if if it's possible the proximity is really rather close we could also send one team member down to that um, facility as well as have people over at the mobile site um, at, at Whole Foods or at the coffee shop nearby We've mm -hmm. even talked about the fact that now some of us are working remotely could be a benefit and who's who's going to be where and making sure we know where our team members are if something like that should happen mm -hmm. and we need to activate someone at, from home or from, you know, another remote location. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds like this person working for the large medical lab should have done your crisis planning. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to take a stab at how in this particular situation, what would you do? So you didn't have a crisis plan. Say this, you know, this, you can't get there. You can't communicate. What are you going to do? I think what Bridget said is, is very close to what everyone should do. I mean, whether it's going to the local McDonald's or knowing where the locations are to get Wi-Fi that might be in a space that are that, that's available mm -hmm. so you can communicate with others. I mean, that's the whole point of our job is to communicate and you right. have to make sure it happens. So you have to get to mm -hmm. the place where you can communicate and then follow through on your action plan. Right. We've, we've even talked about the fact that um, we need to be able to walk to a location. Um, so that's why across the street was, was a good option because our vehicles, 
may be destroyed or we may not be able to get out of the parking lot. And so we need to get out of the building. Um, wh wherever we go needs to be within walking distance oh, and, and accessible. For as much as Nina says this is kind of out of the realm of possibility, you think of Joplin just a couple of years ago. Right. And right. This was a reality for everyone in the city of Joplin. Mm hmm. All right, fine, Chris. <laughs> but no, I think it's it is. I mean, yes, it could it could certainly happen. Um, probably won't happen to most of us. But um, but I think in this situation, what we did differently, I was a little surprised. So you know, I keeping the crisis plan in your desk. Obviously, I mean, a lot of people know you should have one at home. You should have one in your car or whatever. You should have multiple copies, right? Having a list of phone numbers not just in your desk, but other places, right? Um, so that kind of thing. I know that um, I, I believe uh, like Logan has like phones just available and like that can be activated, you know, um, that they're not on campus, they're at another, you know, site. And so, you know, just being as prepared as possible, I think obviously yeah. is the key here and thinking about what if, what if, what if, what if I can't do this? What if I can't get there? What if this is gone or destroyed? And I'm wondering too, Nina, with, um, you know, going into this, you're already at a different site. So mm -hmm. if you had a deputy at the other medical, the main lab, so, you know, for some reason, if you weren't able to get there, that yeah. you have someone else that you can rely on, um, like that would take, mm -hmm. yeah, that would take lead on this. Right. And I think the big thing too is, you know, once you do get access to, whether it's your social media channels or your email, just even if you don't know what's um, what's happening, it's just communicating early and, and showcasing what you do know and mm -hmm. addressing what you're still trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, I read a really interesting book called, it's, uh, it was like Crisis in the Digital Age and they called it an information vacuum. When a crisis happens, you know, media and um, just, general citizens are are contributing to this influx of information and mm -hmm. so you don't want people reading things that aren't necessarily factual so that right you have to put out all the information um, as much and as often as possible so that's the information that they can access right right mm -hmm. If you guys want to um, listen to a, a fascinating, if you haven't already listened to it, a fascinating um, webinar on the PRSA website. It's the, um, this was, I think this was uploaded maybe two years ago, um, maybe just one year ago. But anyway, it's the, um, the director of communications for the Las Vegas um, Chamber of Commerce. And she walks through every single step of the shooting that happened um, during the music festival. And um, it's it's absolutely tragic, but it is it is so fascinating. Um, and um, and she talks about how she was on a plane when it happened, and you know wasn't even wasn't even there. Um, but how her team just assembled and um, you know it, and got through it. And it was not just that day, when that weekend. I mean, this was in, in months and months and months. So really a good one to listen to. So how do you access that, Nina? Where is it? Um, so it's on the, or it was on the PRSA website. Um, if you just search on demand webinars, um, I'll try and find it for you guys and send it out. Um, I know it was available, like when they launched it, it was available for a couple months. So hopefully they haven't taken it down or anything, but it was, it, if you search like crisis, crisis communication, it, it should be one of the ones that popped up. Okay. I think your point too, about, you know, making sure that kind of in that example, people know what the plan is. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, okay, now I need to get out my book and figure yeah. out what to do. It's like, okay, you know, my boss is on a plane, so that means it's me or, mm -hmm. you know, who's doing what and, and what those processes are so that mm -hmm. it doesn't completely catch you off guard. Right, right, exactly, exactly. We have periodic, um, what we call tabletop um, exercises where everyone uh, um, gets in a uh, basically a big room and we have a facilitator that presents the scenario and then each department or person that would have a role can interject what what they would do at that particular time and things could take mm -hmm. you know a bunch of different turns but what I found interesting with that is um, 
you're even in a practice situation, you're still really nervous and, and unsure. And so imagine what it would be like in, in a real life scenario. And so it's good mm -hmm. to practice it, um, even if it's within your small communications group, but if you can practice with the whole team or, you know, leadership, um, I, that was very helpful. Right, right, absolutely. Well, we, we ran through some drills with our client in Southeast Missouri in that uh, we told them we would be doing it over the next month or two to see how they'd respond. And uh, we actually called posing to be a reporter asking questions on their company and ran them through the exercise with them not knowing that it was us doing the phone calls. So mm -hmm. we ran through the exercise. They knew it was going to happen and we wanted to know how they were going to respond to it. So. Uh, I, I think that was a good exercise for the company to go through because they actually learn from their, their lessons of what they did wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Well, let's go to another one. You're the director of public relations and have developed an exec extensive list of key personnel contacts for your crisis plan. The list will be distributed to other key personnel only. Contact information includes home numbers and personal emails, as well as office and cell phone numbers. Your CFO complains to the legal department that having such information on this list makes him uncomfortable. And corporate counsel wants to discuss with you why you think having such a list is necessary. How will you address this issue with key people in this internal public? Time to get a new CFO? <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's almost like putting a disclaimer on there that, um, you know, why you're gathering this information and how you're going to keep it confidential. Mm -hmm. um, because then on the upfront, everyone's aware of, of why it's being gathered and then right. It's distributed. Right. It's funny because I'm actually working on this exact document at work right now. And, um, you know, we have like, I think a lot of the current staff know what it is. They totally get it it's the new staff that don't really know what it's for, or what the purpose is. And so kind of, like you said, explaining what it's for, who has access, how we're gonna keep it confidential, um, why it's important to have, um, has been very helpful when we do have those new staff members who are like, what is this? Why do you need this information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like it's almost like reverse, like, okay, so we don't have that information and now this happens. What 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 kind of predicament are we in now, right? No one's aware, no one has information, you can't communicate. So would you rather be in that situation or you know have a have a list somewhere that you know has got all the contact information on it? Okay. All right. The, your company has a crisis plan in place. The CEO and other members of the executive group have received media training, and the plan has a pecking order of who should respond to reporters. The CEO is first on the list. He is followed by the vice president of operations and then the CFO. Despite executive extensive training, the CFO has never been good with answering reporters' questions. The CEO is quite dynamic. However, your CEO has just been arrested on the suspicion of, of murdering the vice president of operations. Your company needs to address the reporters and the public. Your CFO is quite nervous and says she is not prepared to take on this task. You have just run out of your scripted crisis plan. What do you do? And what would you have done differently? My immediate thought is what would I have done differently is knowing that this person was not comfortable doing this, we would have found somebody else to do it before <laughs> we ever got to this situation. Right, right. Rarely do I have a financial person handling media report like, queries. <laughs> Unless it's related to I'm financials. a little surprised <laughs> that they got that route, but you never know. <laughs> I would say as the communications person, I would take on that role or that person should take on that role of handling the situation or at least uh, postponing media inquiries as long as they can. Okay. Well, and we else? always have someone from the PR team um, attend these types of interviews. And I would like to think that that would help reassure the person that is um, put in, in the situation, as well as um, 
we can always interrupt or you know interject and 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 provide context if we needed to or if yeah so we can always step in and, and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll um because you know it takes time for them to get to you because usually they want it for something like this they want an in-person interview um and that gives us time to work one-on-one -on -one with that person that's being interviewed so we can train them we know i mean if a lot of communications people have you know background in communications journalism so we kind of know what questions they're probably going to ask so we can do kind of a practice interview to mm -hmm. help prepare them for what yeah, they're wondering too is that if the you know cfo is really uncomfortable with uh media interviews you know you're you can create the assets that you need so you know uh, uh the news the news media is going to want anything from you guys, whether it's an interview or a statement or, or what have you. So you could even do a recorded interview with the CFO for a statement, put it up on social media, and that can kind of be a placeholder that you could send to the reporters, you know, hey, here's a statement of our CFO if you'd like to use it on the newscast. Mm -hmm. um, so I think finding alternative creative ways um, to get information out there. Mm -hmm. Good thinking. Good thinking. Yeah, I, I thought hey, maybe developing some talking points, you know, kind of where you guys were going with that, you know, walk them through it, um, you know, kind of coaching them or, you know, worst case scenario, yeah, taking it yourself or finding someone else who was better prepared. Okay. Well, we are at five minutes and I actually had a couple more examples. These were smaller ones, um, but I don't want to take up more time. I thought we'd just review and then open it up for any kind of final questions. So an issue is identified. So anyway, we're reviewing a couple of, of the things we just talked about. An issue is an identified event or trend where you are afforded the time to research the facts and ensure nothing has been overlooked. A crisis is outside the normal experience. It causes top executives to drop all other priorities and it may severely disrupt continuity of the organization's core business. It is a threat uh, to an organization's operations or reputation. A crisis involves the need for leadership to be out front with the public and a crisis can last longer than a day's bad news. Um, I thought that was kind of a nice way to wrap up those two things um, to kind of differentiate them in your mind. Um, so. Are there any questions, um, other areas that we need to clarify or discuss more? Um, are you guys all feeling pretty good about it? I'm feeling better. Good. Good. <laughs> well, I mean, just talking it through with someone yeah. else um, and a, a group, I mean, this is extremely helpful and yeah. Good. I, I hope it was helpful tonight. Obviously, you know, um, we don't know what exactly is going to be on um, the exam. We know um, that, the, the, you know, these are the things you need to to obviously um, kind of have in your mind. And But as much reading as you can do, finding these scenarios, uh, reading articles about case studies, um, that just better prepares you. Um, it just gets you thinking in the right mind frame of um, um, yeah, how you would handle something. What's, what's the first thing we do? Um, so i'm hoping this is, this is helpful so well props to nina you've done an amazing job you've always been on top of everything and uh great job i mean yeah I thanks know. for doing slides nina that was really helpful yeah it was the, absolutely the, the scenarios were really helpful as well yeah uh again it um i, I can just tell you from experience that uh the, get used to those scenario based questions there's going to be a lot on there so the more you can read them You'll be able to pick out by the time you take your exam, I will guarantee it. The more you read, you'll be able to know as soon as you get done reading that scenario, you know exactly what they're looking for. And then you'll look at those answers and you're like, that's it. I don't even need to read all, well, you might need to read all of them, but you're going to know just the, the way you keep, keep practicing and, and reading those scenarios, you'll, you'll figure out what they're looking for. So that's the best advice I can give you. Um, like I said, this is not a memorization kind of exam. It's all about applying and trying to find examples in your daily life and work and the news um, is, the, is a great way to prepare for it and reading as much as you can find online. If anyone is doing the, um, the online cohort, um, I know those sessions can kind of get a little, what am I getting out of this? I believe me, I was there, but the 
the biggest thing you can take away from that, uh, that cohort is all that information they provide you online. Read every single piece of material, every article, every practice quiz question. That is where I felt like I got the most um, out of that. So um, take advantage of that for sure. And, and do try to attend the live sessions because I feel like the people asking questions most of the time, they're the same questions that you're asking too. So um, good luck. I know you guys can all do it. I have, I have faith and confidence that you would keep working. And uh, if you guys have any questions on this topic or any other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, again, I'll, I'll send out this to Jenna and it's got my contact information on it. So if you ever wanna reach out and just chat about a topic or have a question, let me know. Well, thank you again for imposing your words of wisdom and uh, advice to all of us. We truly appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but those members that are uh, PRSA members of the St. Louis chapter, uh, our board voted this year that if you decide to get your APR um, and you do get your APR, we will reimburse you $250 towards your, uh, your costs. <laughs> So it's a big incentive oh. for you guys to get your APR this year, or at least to start trying. That's amazing. I yeah, think, it really. Is. I, I think Kansas City is looking at that. I, I don't know what. It, yeah, sorry, Bridget. We can't. Die I know, but we have. I mean, I think they they have money set aside to to reimburse. I don't know if it's to that extent, but um, every little bit is is helpful. Absolutely, uh, it would be. And if I had to do it all over again, I would not have spent $40,000 on my master's degree. I would have waited and gotten the APR for a much less lower uh, price, but uh, it is what it is at this point. Right. You're, you're all the more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> you should pass it with flying colors. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for everyone's time tonight. Thank you so much for attending and good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.